Hi there, my name is Dan Ramadan and I'm the Right Home Residence at the Saskatoon Public Library and welcome to the Public Salon. The Public Salon is a bi-monthly series where I invite authors to come and read to you from their work. Uh, every couple of months I bring three authors who are amazing, who I love and who are connected one way or another to Saskatoon to read to you from their work, to share with you their art for you to enjoy. Of course, I am broadcasting to you from the sunny, um, unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil people, uh, also known as Vancouver. And I am broadcasting to you in Saskatoon, also known as Treaty, Treaty 6. And I would like to acknowledge the First Nations people across Canada, uh, wherever you are watching uh, this, this uh, podcast from, you might be um, interested in researching the history of the territories that you live upon. And without further ado, I have some fantastic authors for you today. Firstly, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Angie Abdu. Angie Abdu has written seven books and co-edited Writing the Body in Motion, a collection of essays on Canadian sport literature. A starred review in New York's book list declared her best-selling memoir, Home Ice, Reflections of a Reluctant Hockey Mom, a first-rate memoir and a fine example of narrative nonfiction. Angie Abdu is an associate professor at the Creative Writing Department at Athabasca University. Her newest book, which she will read from today, a memoir called This One Wildlife, a mother-daughter memoir launched this spring. I leave you with Angie Abdu. Hi, my name is Angie Abdu. I am a writer from Moose Jaw. I was born and raised in Moose Jaw and I graduated from Central Collegiate in 1987 and then went to University of Regina and stayed in Saskatchewan until I finished my English degree there in 1991. Um, so I haven't lived in Saskatchewan for a long time, but there are things I still think of that I learned there very much. My, at Central Collegiate, my English teacher was Brenda Brody and she was a bit on the strict side, which is exactly what I needed. I was not the most committed and serious student and I like to uh, daydream and gossip. And so being just a little scared of her meant that I learned what she taught me. So I, so I was very focused on reading and writing essays and all kinds of things that have ended up being what I do for a living. Typing was a thing that I learned that who knew how much that would pay off. My goodness, I use that every day. And then my history teacher, Larry Hadwin, he made us write these very intense, um, research essays and he was very strict and structured too which uh, which worked for me and he made us use index cards and I still have index cards all over my office so some people use Scrivener and fancy things like that I find index cards work just great so I do the exact same method that I learned in like 1986 at Central Collegiate so I, I always think of Moose Jaw as my home and I'm grateful every time I get to go back there, which I usually do once a year in July for the Saskatchewan Festival of Words, one of the many beautiful things about that city. So because I love Saskatchewan so much, I was very grateful when Danny, who's currently the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Library, when he asked me to participate in the Saskatchewan reading. I'm currently living in uh, along the Alberta BC border in the Rocky Mountains, so a very different terrain from Saskatchewan. And I just published my eighth book, It's This One Wildlife, and it just came in the mail today. This is the first day I've held it. So in fact, Danny waited because I was waiting to see if they would show up in time to do this recording. And if not, I was going to do one of my previous books. This is my eighth book, um, but it came just in time. So this is my first reading from it. And it's a follow up to my book, Home Ice, Reflections of a Reluctant Hockey Mom which that's very Saskatchewan, but this is, I was about my little hockey player. He's not like this anymore. He's big now, but I wrote a book about the excess in youth sports and uh, driving around to hockey tournaments with him. And then this one is more focused on my daughter and it's kind of what happens when you replace that excess in youth sports with unstructured, non-competitive family time in the wilderness. And anyone who knows me can imagine that I fought against always wanting to impose my own competitive mindset on this unstructured time which was a constant struggle for me but this is so this is a companion book also stands alone but it works as a follow-up to home ice and it's a summer of hiking in the wilderness and lessons I learned as a mother and um, some some things my daughter learned to help work on our confidence and 
same structure as home ice if anyone's read that where it's a pers very personal story but it weaves in research and i'm going to read a short story from part way in it's um i guess a short section i mean uh once my daughter abandoned me she'd had enough of my hikes and i head out to do them on my own so i will read that to you right now without katie i tackle hikes that are bigger higher longer and more remote I am delighted to find myself up to the task. I start to wonder if proving my competence and comfort on the trails was always an underlying motivation for this hiking plan. I have a long-standing habit of making myself the punchline of every joke, and over the years, my experiences in nature have supplied much material. The first summer after Marty and I married, he landed work at a fire tower on top of an inaccessible mountain. He lived there alone for three months. Near the end of summer, his employer arranged a conjugal visit. I was to drive the backcountry roads to a predetermined meeting spot where a helicopter would land and float me up to Marty's shack with enough supplies to keep him there for another couple of weeks. I do not like driving steep mountain roads and I have a poor sense of direction. Fear makes me drive slowly. Experience convinces me that I am most likely lost. For the conjugal visit, I worked myself into a state. The trip took me three times as long as Marty told me it should and I felt sure I'd missed my helicopter. Plus, I thought I'd probably ended up in the wrong spot, so the pilot would never find me anyways. When I spotted two men fly fishing at a river below me, I steered towards them, and Marty's 1986 AMC Eagle, nicknamed Eddie, after Britain's infamous Olympic ski jumper. Dressed exactly like a young woman visiting her new husband in a remote fire tower, all short shorts and bared midriff and big hair, I jumped into the car and ran for the men. My words spilled into each other in an incomprehensible blur. A race pace, I explained to them about trying to find a tower where my husband lived on top of a mountain and I couldn't drive all the way up there, but a pilot should be meeting me at the bottom at the closest mountain. And except maybe I was lost and had they seen any helicopters flying around or maybe I'd missed the pilot entirely because I'd fallen a bit behind schedule trying to navigate this stupid treacherous road. And why couldn't mountain roads be less mount? Just as I really began to gain momentum, I spotted a helicopter. Wave it down, I told them. I think it's my ride. The three of us waved frantically. When the helicopter veered our direction, I got a sinking ill feeling. What if this wasn't my helicopter? What if the pilot had taken our intense waving as evidence of an emergency? What if we'd lured these professionals off course when they should be attending to actual emergencies like the forest fires raging in every direction? As the helicopter got closer, I saw inside its cab, which was stuffed full with firefighters. Oh no, I don't think it's my helicopter, I said to the strange man as the heat of humiliation flooded my body. Stop waving, no, no, wave it off. Despite my no, 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 and my rapid hand gesture shooing the pilot away, and despite the two confused men mimicking my actions, the helicopter got close, growing, growing so loud we couldn't talk. As the three of us backed up to watch it land, I realized the fishermen had not yet spoken to me. I hadn't given them any opportunity. When the machine made contact with the ground, I saw all the firefighters clearly, five of them, faces caked in soot. They jumped out one at a time. The shortest removed a helmet and luscious black hair fell around her shoulders. She smiled wide, her teeth sharp white in contrast to the ash coating her cheeks and chin and forehead. Jen, I recognized her, a gorgeous lifeguard from our local swimming pool. You're a firefighter? Angie, you're in the totally wrong spot and you're late, but I recognize Marty's car. Eddie the Eagle, jump in. Flashing and I loaded groceries, water, into the pilot's dismay, a golden retriever into the cab of the helicopter. The firefighter sat down on the log to wait with the fishermen as the pilot flew me up to join my husband. From the, from the air, I waved goodbye to the two bewildered men who until 15 minutes ago had been enjoying the serenity and solitude of a remote river. When confronted with these kinds of challenges in the backcountry, I have almost always and for decades played the roles of dumb blonde and damsel in distress. The performance comes so easily, it feels almost natural. I have excelled at this helpless woman lost in nature role in both summer and winter. In 2014, two journalists from the New York Times visited Fernie to write a story on British Columbia's Powder Highway. The head honcho in public relations at resorts of the Canadian Rockies asked me to go out with the New Yorkers and tour them around the ski hill. You're all writers, he said, you'll hit it off great. Though appreciative of the potential connection, I felt some skepticism. skepticism. These two men had come to the Powder Highway to ski steep terrain and deep snow. I suspected they wanted high adrenaline and big adventure. 
An article about skiing and Fernie should capture the extreme culture of which I am not a part. I felt sure the journalist would have preferred to be spending a day on the mountain with Marty, not with a middle-aged bookish woman who, when it came to skiing, always chose control over speed. But the New York Times, I called my friend Amanda, far rather than I am, and begged her to join the three of us. These guys will want to know things I told her about the mountain. What do I know? You can tell them. On the chairlift, the journalist showed polite interest in my ski town satire, a novel called The Canterbury Trail. Then they asked questions about our little town, about what people do for work, how often the locals ski, and what we think of the tourism boom, and about whether Fernie lives up to its reputation as the Powder Valley, home of the best snow. So far, so good. Then before we'd even skied our first run, one of them po posed a question beyond my abilities. From our seat on the bear chair, the journalist pointed towards the top of the mountain at the lizard range and asked, which direction is this? I waited for Amanda to answer. She said nothing. I poked her in the side with my elbow, still nothing. Finally, I had to fill the silence. Up, I said with great confidence. Yeah, typically the ski lift takes us in what we like to call the up direction, and then we get off and we ski in the down direction. Over the years, telling and retelling stories like these, I've made myself into a caricature, bookish but incompetent. She's school smart, my brother likes to, get, likes to say. Am I as inept as these stories make me out to be? I know that I'm not dumb or lacking in practical skills, but perhaps I'm a little lazy. If I can leave the planning and the orienteering to my man, I will. Alone, I have no choice. I must figure out this world on my own. The gear, the directions, the schedule, the route, the food, the weather, the first aid kit, all of it. The hikes with Katie, and now these hikes by myself, force me into self-sufficiency. Sorry. Likely my quest for competency has to do with recently turning 50. Well past the age, I should have stopped playing the role of laughable, helpless girl. Mark my 50th, I celebrated by traveling to New York with my two oldest friends, Robin and Robin. Really, that's her names, Robin and Robin. Robin and Robin and I have been friends since we were five years old. But New York marked the first time the three of us, I'm crying, so I'm choking on my water. <coughs> In this New York trip marked the first time the three of us traveled together. As we trekked around the city, I wondered why I chose to expose Katie to remote places to build her confidence and to focus on our mother-daughter bonding. Why not, why not expose Katie to cityscapes instead? The city would in fact be more foreign to Katie than the forest. An urban center would have provided more of an adventure for a small town mountain girl too. In Wild, Cheryl Strayed claims, the wilderness had a clarity that included me. I know this feeling well. I want Katie to know it too. Clarity, in fact, is the perfect gift for a mother to pass to her daughter in this loud, crazy, complex, and confusing world. In hiking, I chased the euphoric release that I experienced with the cottonwood tree, the way I floated above the trivial stresses threatening to drown me, how clearly I recognized their insignificance. In my summer's commitment, the regular long nature walks. I've also developed a practice of drawing on the wilderness for the kind of relief that running with blue in the woods gave me, especially the relief that the wild provided from social media inspired conflicts. I know what I hope to find in nature, what I do find there, serenity, strength, resilience, peace. I want to share those feelings with my daughter. I want her to know nature as a place where she can always retreat when she needs to find solace, clarity, and meaning. At one point in the book, I say that I'm a prairie woman with mountain kids. And I think that is how you heard there. I'm always a little bit on the outside of this world and a little bit trying to find my footing in the natural mountainous world. So even though it's set in the mountains, I think it's a Saskatchewan book in that it's written by a Saskatchewan writer. And I wanna thank Danny again for inviting me to read it this series. And I'm Angie Abdu from Moose Jaw. And this is This One Wildlife. Thank you. Thank you so much. Angie, that was fantastic. I really appreciated being able to be the first to watch this. Um, now I'm going to take you to our next reader, uh, Christine Scarrow. Christine Scarrow is the author of four young adults novels, including The Gamer's Guide to Getting the Girl. She works as the writer in residence as part of the Healing Art Program 
at St. Paul Hospital in Saskatoon and teaches writing as healing within the community. She is currently a student in the MFA in writing at the University of Saskatchewan. I'll leave you with Christine. Hello, I'm going to read from my book, The Gamer's Guide to Getting the Girl, uh, which came, is a young adult novel that came out in 2019. Uh, it follows Zach and Cooper, two boys, two best friends, caught in a mall during one of Saskatchewan's uh, worst storms in history. And um, every chapter uh, has a tip. Uh, for how to get the girl. So there are 18 tips in total. And while they're trapped in the mall during the storm, uh, Zach has uh, met this girl named Samara and he has an instant crush on her. And so, um, yeah, the book follows how he hopes uh, to try and get the girl. So I'm going to read from tip number two, which is girls love a guy who is good with babies. What's going on? Chris's voice rises. The entire mall is black except for the lit exit sign pointing to one of the entrances. Still, we're in front of his store and we decide to go back in. I thought I had a flashlight around here somewhere. We can hear things spilling onto the ground as Chris fumbles in the dark. Need a light? I ask Chris, using the flashlight on my iPhone. Yeah, that'll help. The light from the iPhone's enough for him to discover that the flashlight he thought he had by the register is no longer there. Maybe it's in the back. You want to come shine the light back there for me? The three of us shuffle towards the storage room at the rear of the store. Chris kicks a couple of boxes out of the way so that the three of us can fit. Careful, it's a little crowded in here, Chris warns. Boxes are stacked almost to the ceiling with stock for the store. Metal racks line one wall and random pieces of shelving that have broken off litter the floor. There's a small wooden desk against the wall, but the surface is so cluttered, it's hard to know what anything is. I'll check this drawer, Chris says, pointing to the right-hand side of the desk. I shine the light toward it. Bingo, Chris says. It's a miracle he'd find anything in this room. He picks up a medium-sized black flashlight and flicks it on. It illuminates the room even more. Sure hope this power outage passes soon. Why don't you boys head out? Get home before the storm gets any worse. I'm good now that I have this flashlight. Now I just have to find where I put my phone. He starts rummaging through the papers on his desk. Yeah, I better get home, Cooper says. It's my mom's birthday today and we're going out for supper. All right, see you later, Chris. I follow Cooper back out of the store. The mall takes on a whole new atmosphere with the lights out. The metal security grates are already pulled across their store entrances. It feels more like walking through a dark prison than a shopping center. We pass the food court and see that it's deserted. All of the restaurants have closed up already. Only the red exit sign by the entrance glows. Outside the glass doors, it's dark and gloomy. The rain is coming down in sheets. It's weird, there's no one around. Did everyone go home already? Nope, everyone's over there, Cooper points. Sure enough, down the corridor, there's a group of about 30 people. As we approach, we see a security guard standing by the elevators. I'm sorry, but none of you can go through here, he says to the group. I need to get home, a man in a business suit grumbles. Me too, echo a few others. We can't grant access to this area at the moment, the guard repeats. He's over six feet tall and easily 300 pounds. He stands on the balls of his feet in front of the elevators and the stairway, poised like an Atari paddle playing Pong, ready to cover whatever area he needs to. But my car's down there, the man in the suit says, his voice rising. I understand, sir, but you have to remain here until we can give the all clear. With the power outage, we've encountered a situation. What kind of situation? The man's voice booms. I've got a Porsche Cayenne down there. If anything happens to it, this mall is going to pay. He tugs on his shirt collar, his face reddening. Cooper whistles under his breath. Way to announce that, buddy. A Porsche, hey? I hear someone say. They lick their lips like Cheshire cats. Better hope that guy makes it to his car before those two do, Cooper says, leaning into me. I laugh. He's seeing the same thing I am. What's the problem? A woman calls out. Others join in. Yeah, what's going on? It seems there's been a water main break of some sort outside. We have to make sure it's safe to exit. The security guard's ID tag hangs from a lanyard on his neck. His name is George. George, I say, hoping that his using his first name will help. You're saying we can exit through the other doors at least? It might not be safe there either, George says. 
safe, the man in the suit pipes in. Why wouldn't it be safe? It's dark and there's water everywhere. We can't let anyone out at the moment, sir. I need you all to be patient while we figure this out. It's hard to make out the faces of most of the people waiting unless you're up close with them, but the darkness also makes it so that we can move around without everyone seeing us. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Cooper asks. I've been looking around for an alternate exit. Should we go back down to the food court doors? I whisper. We can text our parents to come get us there. Yeah, but what about my car? Cooper says. I know, but you have to go. Your parents can bring you back to get the car later. Coop starts texting his dad, so I start texting my parents too. Whoever answers first, that's who will pick us up, Cooper decides. <clears throat> oh my God, look at it outside. I can't believe my eyes. The rain's coming down so hard you can't even see the sidewalk 10 feet away. The newer spindly trees planted around the perimeter of the mall are bent almost completely sideways from the wind. The busy road that surrounds the mall could be deserted for all we know because we can't see behind the curtain of grey that masks the world outside. That's insane, Cooper says wide-eyed. Wow, I whisper. I push on the door to step outside, but it's locked. What? I push harder. It's sealed tight. Do you need some help? Cooper teases. He lines up beside me and gives the door a good shove. It doesn't budge. Are you kidding me? We're locked in? It doesn't seem possible. We both stand there stunned and then Cooper points. It looks like there's a stairwell here. A big gray metal door marked mall staff only is tucked into a small corridor. I'm taking the stairs. He flings open the door and starts down the stairs. I'm frozen on the spot. It says it's for staff only. I don't want to get in trouble. You coming or what? Cooper calls up to me from the first landing just before the door swings shut. If we can just get downstairs and get to the car, we can get out of here right away and none of our parents would need to come. He's right, it's the best option. I take a deep breath and follow him. Hopefully the staircase will lead to the underground parking lot. We turn to go down the final flight and freeze in our tracks. Uh, I don't think we should go down there, I stammer. Water's rushing into the stairwell from underneath the metal door at the bottom. The water's rising and has already covered the bottom stair. What's going on? Cooper moves down closer. Help me open this door. Is this a good idea? I ask. Maybe we should just go back and wait with the others. Okay, you sissy. And then maybe we'll be here all night. Come on, I'm sure we'll get through here. We have to step right into the water in order to pry open the door. I look down at my shoes and start to kick them off. Are you kidding me? Cooper says, shaking his head. At least let me roll up my jeans then, I say. He laughs and waits for me to roll up my jeans. We step into the water. It's icy cold. Right away, the water feels like daggers on my feet and shins. Could this water be any colder? Will you just help me get this open, Cooper says. He's tugging on the door without much success. I grab the top part of the handle while he takes the bottom and we pull as hard as we can. It starts to give, a gush of water rushes in, and then the door sucks back to a closed position before we can get around it. On three, I say. We count and try again, and more water rushes through. Now the second stair is covered, and the water is well past our ankles. Where's all this water coming from, I say. We're both panting from pulling so hard. Once more, Cooper asks, and I nod. This time we pry the door open enough for Cooper to get his shoulder through before the door starts to pull closed again. Zack, he cries out. I pull as hard as I can, my whole body bent back towards the stairs. I don't want you to get crushed, I say, pulling. My heart is racing. I'm in. Come on. He slips around the door and digs his feet into the ground to push the door open with his back. Water continues to pour in. I make it around the door just as Cooper loses his footing and the door slams shut behind us. Whew, that was close, I pant. But nothing could have prepared me for what's next. The entire underground parking lot is flooded. Icy water laps at our kneecaps. It's about a foot high and the tires of all the cars are half submerged. There's no way anyone will be leaving in a car. Zack, Cooper yells, pointing to the other side of the lot. Cars are floating at the far end, literally bouncing on the water and tapping into each other like bumper cars. This is not good, I say softly. We have to go back upstairs, Cooper says. We can tell them what we've seen. A water main break can do all this, I wonder. 
Well, look, it's raining like crazy too. It's been raining all day. It just seems so strange to me that cars are actually floating. I hope we can get that door open again. We use all of our might and the door opens comes open enough for both of us to shove our way through before it slams shut again. We run up the stairs, splattering water everywhere. The rubber on our wet shoes makes loud squeaky sounds and water squirts out of them like sponges being squeezed with every step. Thank you. That was such a departure from uh, Angie's readings. Thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate it. Um, my next reader is uh, Alexis Kindlin. Alexis Kindlin grew up in Saskatoon, but she now lives in Edmonton. She is an alumni of the University of Saskatchewan, where she obtained an honors degree in international studies. She is the author of four books, including two books of poetry, a biography, and the novel Mad Cow, which came out during the pandemic, no, of course, thing. She currently works as an agriculture journalist with Alberta Farmer newspaper. Alexis' poetry, fiction, journalism, and nonfiction articles have appeared in numerous publications and on the internet. Matt Cow can be purchased at Turning the Tie and McNeil Robson, Robinson in Saskatoon. All right, we leave you folks with Alexis. Hi, my name is Alexis Kinlan. I'm originally from Saskatoon and miss it very much. Um, I'm, today I'm going to be reading from my book, Mad Cow, which came out during the pandemic. Um, it was released in uh, April 2020. Uh, the story is about um, Albertan ranchers and how BSE or mad cow disease uh, really affected the farm families. Um, so all you need to know about the book, the main character's name is Allison and uh, her father's name is Gord, and we're in small town Alberta in 2003. Her dad's tired red pickup trundled down the street through the dust. It was so dry this year, a carryover from the drought last year. He pulled the truck up to the curb in front of the flagpole and honked. Allison stood up, picked up her trumpet case, and walked toward him. Thanks for coming to get me, she said as she did up her seatbelt. Dad, you, need, you should buckle up, she said, looking over at him. Seriously. Her father nodded but didn't say anything. He fumbled around him, found the seatbelt, and pulled it across his body. Her father looked more tired than usual. Even his face looked slack, as if his cheeks wanted to slide off his face and onto the ground. He was in his mid-forties, and that was impossibly old to her. Would she ever be that old? Would she look like him, with cheeks that were permanently wind-stained? Not if she could help it. She didn't want the same kind of life he had. Her father's belly had grown rounder in recent years and her mom gave him a hard time about it. You need to watch what you eat, her mother would say to him. No more snacks out in the truck. No more chips in front of the TV. I work hard, her dad said when he sat down at night, falling into his lazy boy to watch the news or the Oilers. Sometimes I just want a beer and chips. Is that too much to ask? It's going to your belly, his, her mother said. And that's not healthy. Shania Twain was on the radio singing about feeling like a woman. Allison thought about turning it off, but didn't. They only got two stations in town. Allison looked out the window at her school. Only three more years. Then she could finally get out of here. Her dad tapped his hands on the steering wheel. Allison's mom said it was a good thing her dad had a job that allowed him to be physical because he wouldn't have been able to sit at a desk all day. He needed to move. Your dad never would have survived in the city, she said. He needs to be out on the farm. Allison looked out the window at the town. It was the same old. Her mother said the entire town needed a new coat of paint. Her dad turned the pickup away from the school and drove towards the main drag. But instead of turning towards the road that would take them to the highway, he continued up the street. Aren't we going home? Allison asked. Nope, her dad said, we're going to Joe's. I need to talk to the guys. Something big happened today. Allison looked at him, not wanting to ask. Everything's fine, her dad said. Everything's okay. I just need to catch up on the local gossip. Allison would have preferred to go home, eat her supper, and watch TV, but she didn't mind hanging out at Joe's. She might be able to talk to Jeff, who was in a few classes with her at school. His dad, Joe Chin, ran the restaurant. Her dad drove up the street and circled the block, 
looking for a parking spot. Dad, Allison said, letting her voice go into a slight whine. Why don't you just park and walk a few blocks? Her dad kept on driving around the block until a truck pulled out from a spot just in front of the Drew Drop, Drew Drop Inn. See, her dad said, smiling, we can park like the rock stars we are if we just wait. Allison opened the door and jumped out. I'm going to leave my trumpet in the car, so maybe you should lock it. Why don't you just bring it in, her dad said. Just lock the door, she said. It's not going to kill you. She locked her own door and then listened to make sure her dad locked his side. Allison walked into Joe's first, her dad following behind. Inside, Joe's smelled like cigarette smoke and the oily scent of grease from french fries and the buffet table. Two tables full of people waved or nodded at Gord and Allison as they walked by. Allison wondered what it would be like to live in a city where you didn't know half the people around you. Her dad always liked to say you couldn't fart in town without half the town hearing about it. Gord caught up with Allison and then walked ahead of her, waving at two guys who were already seated. Doug Miller was wearing a co-op cap and drinking a coffee, while old Ray Sharp sat beside him. Are Craig and Al coming? Doug asked as Allison and Gord approached the table. Doug sh Gord shook his head. Nah, I think Dad went to Hills and Craig is driving some cattle to the border. He had a long haul ahead of him. He's not back yet. Nice to see you, Ray Sharp said as Allison sat down next to him. Her father sat on the other side of her. Ray squeezed her arm and gave her a big smile. Ray's wife had passed a while ago, but he was still in cattle. All of the neighbors helped him out when he needed it. Their farm wives doted on him, bringing him pies and fresh baking. His sons, their wives, and his grandkids came back all the time for visits. Allison liked Ray, his aura of genuine kindness, and his big smile, filled with teeth that gleamed so white that they were probably fake. Allison looked around for Jeff, but didn't see him. Before she could blink, Joe came to their table with an armful of menus. Nice to see you all, he said. Don't you ever work? Doug crossed his arms over his large belly and laughed. Allison found it hard not to stare at his gut. She wondered how Doug could move about, balancing his huge belly on his skinny legs. She hoped her father wouldn't end up like that. We don't want you to go broke, Doug said. You need to be able to feed your kids. Joe laughed and gestured around the table. Coffee's for everybody? Allison shook her head. I'll have a Coke. Gord put his menu down on the table. I don't know why you brought us these menus, Joe. We all know these menus like we know our wives cooking. Unless you get, got something new? Joe shook his head. Nope, still same. He had a Chinese accent. The Chins had immigrated from China, but they had been in the community for many years and were well known. Their two children were both born in town. I don't even have to look at this, Doug said, placing the menu back on the table. I'll have fly, fries and a double burger. Allison ordered a small cup of wonton soup and tuned out while Ray and her father ordered. The TV in the back corner was showing an episode of Jeopardy. The chins always had closed captioning on so you could focus on the TV if you didn't feel like talking to the other people at your table. Shame about the border, Ray Sharp said. I just feel glad that I downsized last year after the drought. I'm not feeding many cows. I'd heard it earlier today and it's just gonna be trouble. I've got a lot of cows ready to go, Doug said. We're just going to get slammed again, Gord said. I'm trying not to get worked up about it, but it, this could be a major hit in the pocketbook. What can we really do about it, Doug asked. These government guys need to figure it out. All I know is I'm going to be watching the news. Hopefully they get it resolved before I need to ship my cows. If not, I'm going to have to get down on my knees and pray. If they don't take any of our beef, this could affect the whole country, Ray said. This whole thing makes me sad. The beef is safe. It's just the one cow so far but this could kill the industry. Allison was used to farming conversation about how there wasn't enough rain or it was too cold or too hot or prices were down. The cows were too skinny or the bull was shooting blanks or the equipment was broken and parts hadn't come into town yet. Nothing was more boring than news unless it was news about farming. But today had a different feel to it. The men were resigned and subdued. Her dad kept on fidgeting with the salt shaker and Ray, who smiled constantly, looked serious and hadn't, hadn't even offered her gum or asked her about school or if she had a boyfriend. Doug propped his head up with his hand as if it was too heavy for him to hold up. As Allison watched, he patted the breast pocket in his plaid shirt, putting his hand on a square package. I'm going up for a smoke, he said, standing up. Thought you gave that up, Gord said. Most of the time, yeah, Doug said, but today is a smoking day. I'm going outside for some fresh air. Allison watched as he stood up and walked out of the restaurant. Nobody said anything when he left. Normally the men would have been laughing and joking, telling stories about what some of the other farmers they knew had been up to. But today they sat in a reserved silence. 
I wonder if we can get Joe to change the channel, Gord said. It's got to be on the news. Jeff showed up with the coffees and Coke, and Allison caught his eye. I'll be in the back booth in a few minutes, he said as he put her drink in front of her. If you want to wait for me, I can hang with you for a little bit. Allison took her Coke, Coke and stood up. Dad, I'm going to go sit in the back. Gordon nodded, but he was staying at, staring at some far off spot over her head. May 20th, 2003, Jay, Ray Sharp said, taking a sip of coffee and shaking his head. We're not going to forget it. I'm just hoping this doesn't end up like the UK, her dad said. Allison walked away while her dad continued to talk. When she looked at him, back at him, he was slouched over the table, waving his hands about the way he did, always did when he was emotional about something. The way he hunched over made him look old. She didn't want to keep on thinking about that. She sat down at the table in the back nearest the kitchen and kept on watching Jeopardy. Jeff's homework was piled on the table. All the regulars knew this table belonged to the Chin Kids and no one ever took it. She recognized his copy of the Stone Angel that they'd been studying in English class, along with his math textbook and a couple of notebooks. Jeff had told her it was too quiet at home and he found it hard to study there. One of Jeff's large sketch pads lay on the table. Allison looked at the whirling loops of his doodles on the front cover. Jeff liked to draw anime characters and he was good at it. He was the one who had introduced her to anime. One time she'd gone over to, watch, to his house to watch Akira. No one else had been home and the chin house was small and quiet. It was too neat, as if they were expecting company. The house was only a few blocks from the restaurant. Allison looked at the pictures of Chinese people on the walls. The pictures were black and white and the people in them stilted and formal. Allison liked hanging out with Jeff, but she'd been uncomfortable while they were alone in his house. Immediately after they finished the, watching the movie, she called her mom to come get her. After a few minutes, Jeff's mom, Winnie, came and put a bowl of soup in front of her. Thanks, Allison said. The warm, salty taste of the broth was comforting and she realized how hungry she was. She picked up a wonton with her china spoon and examined it. Colton, her brother, always said wontons looked like calf testicles. After he said that, the image haunted her, but that didn't mean she was gonna stop eating wontons. She was a farm kid after all. Allison studied the restaurant, taking in the plastic tabletop in front of her and the green of the carpet. She liked the wallpaper in the restaurant, its iridescent peacocks edged with flecks of gold. Her mom said it was garish, but Allison thought places in China must have wallpaper like this. Jeff walked by and waved. Just have to serve a few more tables, he said. I'll try and take a break soon. Allison nodded and kept on eating her soup. The bell over the front door chimed and her cousin, cousin Chloe entered the restaurant, followed by Jamie. Allison wondered if she should wave at them. She stopped, stared down at her soup. Chloe was laughing about something. Her dad saw Chloe and raised his hand in acknowledgement. Hi, Uncle Gore, Chloe said. Jamie nodded at him and walked over to the corner, choosing a table with two chairs near the window. Allison waved at Chloe, trying to catch her cousin's eye. Chloe ignored her and went to join Jamie. For a second, Allison wondered if her cousin had seen her. Why wouldn't Chloe say hi? She watched as Winnie went to their table to give them menus. She looked back down at her soup, which she had nearly finished, before turning her eyes up to the television again. Should she go over and talk to them? She looked over to see if they had noticed her. They were talking and laughing, oblivious to everyone else in the restaurant. They were too far away for her to hear what they were saying. She looked around for Jeff. I'll be there soon, Jeff said as he passed through the door, holding a tray with four Cokes and a plate of fries on it. We're a bit short-staffed today. One of the waitresses called in sick. He stopped for a moment at the table before walking towards Chloe and Jamie, delivering Cokes and fries to the table of seniors beside them. Allison wished she brought her school bag in from the car. She picked up Jeff's copy of the Stone Angel, even though she had already read it twice and was sick of it. Anything would be better than sitting here, pretending she wasn't alone while her cousin and her friend sat at one table and her dad sat at another. She hoped Jeff would join her soon. He put Cokes down at Chloe's table. What would happen if she pulled up a chair and joined them? She got up and walked toward their table, abandoning her empty bowl. Hey, she said as she pulled up a chair and sat down beside her cousin and her friend. What are you guys up to? Jamie fiddled with her straw. Chloe sighed. Not much, she said. Jamie said. Want to go over to Ben's later? I think Josh is going to be there too. I need to spend more time with Josh, Chloe said. We've been chatting on MSN, but I don't think he knows that I like him yet. Although we were talking about the movies, and he said that sometimes he likes to drive to Lloydminster to go to the movies there. 
He actually typed, maybe it'd be fun to go to the city to see a movie. I couldn't believe it. It was almost like he was asking me on a date. He's totally into you, Jamie said. Ben thinks so too. I've been asking him to find out for you, but he's not sure how to ask. He doesn't want to ask in front of the other guys. Why don't you just ask him if he likes you? Allison asked. Or why don't you just ask him out? Chloe looked down at her t hands on the table. Her cousin's nails were a bla bright lilac color. This was new. Her cousin didn't like to draw attention to her hands. She had bitten her nails for years and even used to bite at the cuticles around the nail bed. The silence was uncomfortable. Why was it taking so long for her cousin to answer her? Jamie and Chloe looked at each other and in their glance, Allison could tell they wanted to leave. You just don't do that, Jamie said, taking a long slip, sip of Coke. How can you expect a guy to like you if you ask him out first? I had to fl flirt with Ben for weeks before he finally clued in. Then I had to wait for him to make the first move. That's just how you get a boyfriend. If you ask him first, he's gonna think you're desperate or something. Thank you so much. All right, that was all the fun for today. Thank you so much for joining us for the public salon. I hope you enjoyed your time with our three leader, readers, leaders and readers, sure. Uh, and I hope to see you next time. My next public salon is going to be my last before I end my residency, so I am trying to make it the best one yet. All right, take care.